Good evening. It's wonderful to see you as we gather to worship God together. You're very welcome indeed. John 8 verse 12 is perhaps one of the best known verses in John's Gospel, if not the Bible as a whole. In it Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Let's join in prayer together. You, Lord Jesus, are the light of the world, and it's in your light that we see light. We thank you for the light that you give in your word that reveals who you are, how we can be right with you, what we need from you, and how you offer it to us. We thank you too for the gospel sacraments of baptism and the Lord's Supper and the light that is to be seen in them, testifying as they do to who you are, what you've accomplished and what you offer to sinners. Lord Jesus, as we prepare our hearts this evening to celebrate communion this Lord's Day, as indeed we celebrate baptism this evening, May we know your enabling and power, so that in all we engage in together, we're able to honour you. Pour out your spirit here to that very end, we pray, for Christ's sake. Amen. We'll stand and sing together as we are gathered. Jesus is here. Join again in prayer together. Let's pray. What a great thing it is, Lord Jesus, that you are here. Truly, you're everywhere. You're in our homes when we are not in them, and when we are in them, you're in every space that lies between here and our home. You're in our place of education or work. You're in the places where we play music or sport or socialize. You're not only in this land, but you're in every land under heaven. There's not a place where you aren't. And yet we thank you, Lord, that when your people gather in worship, when we meet together with our hearts and minds focused on who you are, there's a special sense in which you're present. Your presence is known, you reveal yourself, you make us aware of who you are and how you're here. And so we pray, Lord Jesus, that as we are gathered this evening, we may know your presence in a very particular way. Come and glorify your name as we worship you together for your holy sake. Amen. Don't be too alarmed if I come a little closer. I want to read just now from Paul's epistle to his colleague Titus. It's mere three chapters long, the book of Titus one of the pastoral epistles, as they're usually referred to. First and Second Timothy and Titus were 
Paul is writing to a younger pastor, uh, and here he's coming towards something of a conclusion, and we hear together the word of God from Titus 3, verse 1 through to verse 8. Remind the people to be subject to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready to do whatever is good, to slander no one, to be peaceable and considerate, and always to be gentle towards everyone. At one time we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. But when the kindness and love of God our Saviour appeared, he saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Saviour so that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. This is a trustworthy saying, and I want you to stress these things, so that those who have trusted in God may be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. These things are excellent and profitable for everyone. Amen. Uh, In just a moment, I'm going to invite our new communicants to come to the front, uh, all of whom will make a public profession of their faith and thus be welcomed into the membership of Christ's Church, uh, and one of whom at the same time will be baptised. There will be promises made by those new communicants, uh, and all of us as a congregation will be invited to make a promise to you, a promise that you've already made if you yourself are a communicant member of Christ's Church. Uh, It's a promise on our part to walk in fellowship and service to the Lord with the new communicants according to the leading of the Spirit and the light of God's Word. And I warn you of this now so that when I put that question to you in a moment's time, we might hear a hail and heart a We do. Uh, The new communicants have been at the manse every Sunday evening, I think during the month of April it was, uh, and they've been subject to all manner of things there, my rather poor attempts at hospitality and my even poorer attempts to keep my dog in uh, check. And at least one new communicant was welcomed by the dog before they were welcomed by me. Uh, In fact, that might have happened to several of them. Uh, They've also been subject to my love for the shorter catechism uh, and the period of the life of the church from which it comes. And at the risk of keeping everybody for a while this evening, I'm going to indulge that just a little bit. Uh, One of the authors to whom I am most indebted is a man by the name of John Owen. He wasn't involved in the production of the Shorter Catechism. He came maybe just a little too late for that. But in the latter half of the 17th century, he was probably the most influential uh, minister and theologian in the UK. Uh, And some would say I would probably be among them, that he's the most influential English-speaking theologian there's ever been. Well, why am I waffling on about John Owen? One of my favourite John Owen statements is this. When God decided to save sinners, he provided two great gifts. The gift of his son and the gift of his spirit. The son purchases salvation on the cross and the spirit applies it to individuals as he leads them to see who Jesus is and wins them to Christ. God has sent the sudden, and God has sent his spirit. That is what Paul is talking about to Titus, isn't it? He says that God has saved his people by the sending of his sudden, through washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, 
whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Christ loved us so much that he went to a cross to pay the penalty for our sin. That, in truth, is not something that we would ever come to have realised or appreciated were it not for the ministry of the Spirit that opens the eyes of hearts to see the truth of who Jesus is and what he has done. As new communicants come, they profess their faith in God as their Father, in Jesus Christ as their Saviour and Lord, and in the Holy Spirit as their sanctifier and guide. As we celebrate baptism together, we see in the outpouring of water on somebody's head symbolism of the outpouring of Christ's blood on the cross and symbolism of the outpouring of God the Holy Spirit who this day continues to open hearts and minds and show who Jesus is and win people to him and enable people to live to his glory. God the Father has given his church two wondrous gifts, the gift of his Son and the gift of his Spirit. As we engage in these wonderful moments this evening, as we prepare for communion and as we celebrate baptism, as we all engage in that, whether we're making public profession of faith or we're witnessing others do it, let's see symbolized here those two astoundingly great gifts. Let's pray together. Oh, what an amazing thing you have done, Father God, in sending your Son to be our Saviour and in sending your Spirit that we may understand what your Son has done and may embrace him as Saviour and Lord gladly and from the heart. Grant then that your Holy Spirit would be active now so that as professions and promises are made, as baptism is administered and as all hearts are turned toward you, that Christ may be revealed in his glory and that your name may be honoured by one and by all. It is for Christ's sake that we ask it. Amen. Can I invite you all to stand and our new communicants uh, to come to the front. I'm afraid I've forgot my water pistol, David, so you have to make do with the jug. Three questions for you all, and then what has I said for the congregation? Do you confess your faith in God as your heavenly Father, in Jesus Christ as your Saviour and Lord, and in the Holy Spirit as your sanctifier and guide? Have you repented of your sin with a humble and contrite heart and put your trust in the mercy of God in Christ Jesus? Do you promise in dependence on God's grace to live in the fellowship of the church and to share in its worship and work and to give and to serve as God enables you to advance his kingdom throughout the world? Thank you. Members of the congregation, do you welcome Sydney, David, Johnny, Gareth, Oriana, Hannah and Emma? And do you promise to walk with them in fellowship and service at the leading of the Spirit of God and in light of the Word of God? Yeah. Hail and hearty indeed. Thank you. David, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. We'll join in prayer together. Lord Jesus, we do thank you for how baptism symbolizes the wonder of what you've done on the cross, and the great gift that is the outpouring of your Holy Spirit. We thank you for the privilege of public worship and the privilege of making public profession of our faith. And so we thank you this evening, Lord, for Emma and Hannah and Oriana, 
for Johnny and for Gareth, for David and for Sydney. We thank you for this special moment in their lives and indeed this special occasion in the life of our church. Uh, grant that we all may be refreshed and re-enthused in faith, that we may have a fresh sight of the glory of Christ, and that we may thus be enabled in the Spirit's power to love and serve you with all that we have and are. It is for Christ's sake that we ask him. Amen. Delighted to welcome you all into the communicant membership of the church. I'm delighted also to be able to offer you a little gift. Uh, I know you're used to receiving three books from esteemed authors, but this evening you have to make up with uh, me or C. H. Spurgeon. Eva, Thank you. you're very welcome. Ariana, Thank you. you're very welcome. Must be Hannah, yeah. <laughs> you're Thank very you. welcome. <laughs> Charlie, Thanks. you're very welcome. Thank you. Gareth, you're very welcome. Thank you're you. very welcome, David. Thank you. Thank you. You're very welcome, Sydney. But you've all got through that rightly, and uh, everyone can take their. Oh no, you can't. We're going to sing. <laughs> I was going to say you take your seats. You can take your seats after we sing, but you can move back to where you were sitting if you like. Uh, we'll sing together. I will offer up my life and spirit and truth.
Our second scripture reading this evening is from 1 Corinthians chapter 10, again beginning at verse 1 and reading through to verse 13. We hear together the word of the true and living God. For I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud and that they all passed through the sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that rock was Christ. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them. Their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Uh, now these things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. Do not be idolaters as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat up and got up and eat and drink and indulge in revelry. We should not commit sexual immorality as some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 of them died. We should not test Christ as some of them did, and were killed by snakes. And do not grumble, as some of them did, and were killed by the destroying angel. These things happened to them as examples, and were written down as warnings for us, on whom the culmination of the ages has come. So if you think you're standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you're tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. Amen. We'll join again in prayer together. Let's pray. Lord God Almighty, we thank you for your precious and holy word. We thank you for its heart-searching ability, for the way in which when brought home to the heart by the Holy Spirit, it shows us something of what we're really like in a way even that we didn't understand before. Thank you, moreover, for its redemptive message, for how it points to Jesus Christ, for how from beginning to end the scriptures speak of him as the all-sufficient saviour. Lord Jesus, grant us grace as we engage with these verses that we've just read together to understand who you are and to yield up the heart truly to you. As we bring our prayers for others this evening, we think of all who this evening find themselves in one form of particular need or another. Some, Lord, are deeply anxious, whether relating particularly to the pandemic or in a wider sense. Some still feel very acutely the pain of bereavement. Some have circumstances to do with their own health or the health of a loved one or their work or lack of work that are really difficult to bear. Give to each one the grace that they most need, we pray. And as we pray, Lord, for the wider world, we think of Israel and Palestine we recognize that these words we've just read from 1 Corinthians draw so heavily on the Old Testament uh, that Paul, as a man, was very conscious of his Jewish heritage and that he rightly saw in your dealings with ancient Israel much that foreshadowed Christ and all that he would accomplish, not only for that nation but for all nations. We recognize, Lord, that... Uh, Israel and Palestine has for such a long time been an area where there is deep-seated conflict, much suffering, 
and in many ways from a human perspective altogether intractable difficulty. We look to you that you may have mercy on all people who dwell there, that you may show them your goodness and your grace, that there may be a true and lasting period of peace, and that by Jew and Arab alike, the Prince of Peace may be seen to be Jesus Christ. It is for his great and holy sake that we ask it. Amen. King of kings, majesty, God of heaven, living in me, we'll stand and sing together. do I have this for? I say that, I hope I'm not going to drop it and potentially lose it. There'll be all kinds of ramifications should that happen. What do I have it before? I must confess I have had it for quite some time and for much of that time I have probably been unconscious of the fact that I have it. It's just become part of the furniture, part of the background, and maybe days, weeks, months, even years have passed without me being conscious of the fact that it's on my finger and without me thinking very much about why I wear it and what it symbolises and why it matters. And quite honestly, I probably wouldn't have come to think about that in a fresh way had it not been for the fact that one of my very inquisitive children said, Daddy, why have you got a ring and what's it about? And that, of course, reminded me why I do have it and got me thinking about it. Uh, what's it there for? Well, I suppose the idea is that every so often it catches my eye and it reminds me of my wife and it renews my appreciation for her. And indeed, it goes a little beyond that, and it encourages and maybe even inspires me to do my best to be a good husband. I wonder if in some way the sacraments are a little like that. There are two gospel sacraments, and 
as things have worked out, we're celebrating them at more or less the same time. Baptism this evening and the Lord's Supper on Sunday morning. And maybe it comes to be the case for many of us that they're just sort of there as part of the background. And you come along to church and, oh, this Sunday it's communion. And really you wonder, does that really make a whole lot of difference? Maybe the service lasts a little longer than it might otherwise have done. uh, And you participate in a way that you wouldn't otherwise have done. But perhaps it's a go through the motions, not that big a deal kind of occasion. Maybe at times, we, ministers included, are inclined to look on the bread and wine much the way I've been looking on my wedding ring. It's there, kind of glad it's there, but don't think about it a whole lot. Maybe even that is all the more the case when it comes to baptism. Uh, If it's your baptism, or it's your baby's baptism, or your niece, or your nephews, or your grandchild's, well, that's a very special occasion, isn't it? And the memories of that will stick with you, and oh, you're excited about that day. But if it's somebody else's, if it's another member of the church who maybe you don't know very well, you stand up and you think, isn't the baby very cute? But in terms of spiritual engagement, well, maybe again it's a little bit like me and my wedding ring. You're glad it's there, but you don't think a whole lot about what it means and what it might symbolize and what it might even be meant to inspire. Perhaps then the pandemic that has interrupted so the celebration of the sacraments gives us an opportunity, now that we can celebrate them in public again, to reconsider what they mean and to come to a deeper appreciation than maybe I or even you had before. Surely, a little like my wedding ring, they're meant to have an inspiring effect. That when we celebrate baptism, whether it's you are being baptized or somebody that you don't even know, Or indeed, when we celebrate the Lord's Supper, surely the plan of God in that is that it has an inspiring effect upon you, that it shows you anew who Christ is, that it lifts your heart to the throne, that it captivates you anew with his redeeming love, and that it inspires you by his Spirit's enabling to live to the glory of his holy name. Christ surely intends his sacraments to have an inspiring effect upon his beloved people. I dare say you'll have picked up the impression from 1 Corinthians 10 verses 1 to 13 uh, that all was not as well as it might have been in the church in Corinth to whom Paul wrote. Uh, And if you're familiar with the letter as a whole, you'll grasp that that is quite the understatement. There were problems going on in the Corinthian church that were simply astounding. There were many blessings. There were lots of things to be thankful for. But there were all kinds of weird and wacky ideas and all kinds of utterly outrageous and unchristian practices. Paul, in a very positive and yet very forthright manner, wrote, inspired by the Spirit, to address that. One of the principal problems, one of the root problems, you might say, was a certain spiritual complacency. Uh, People who had taken part in spiritual experiences, people who were engaged in the life of the church, people maybe who had special times together in public worship in the past, and thus assumed that all was well with them, and really they could live whatever way they like, because after all, we've had these great experiences in the past, so God must be very pleased with us, uh, and we're all right, so we'll just do what we feel like. Paul, in these verses, is very much addressing that idea 
front on, isn't they? And he's seeking to rouse the Corinthian Christians out of their complacency. He reminds them that ancient Israelites who had in many ways great spiritual experiences, yet many of them ended up under the punishment of God. Paul says these things happened as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. Then he goes on to give some specific examples. Strikingly, the first few of those examples are all pretty evidently evil things, as Paul says. Idolaters turning away from the living God to worship other things. Uh, The very thing, I think you'd have to say, that Adam and Eve first did. The thing that the Israelites so blatantly did when they uh, built the statue and worshipped it when Moses was up the mountain. Or more obvious still, uh, sexual immorality, indulging in revelry. Uh, Well, most of us, I suppose, can see pretty readily that those are evil things. Look where Paul's list of evil things concludes. Verse 10. Do not grumble. Goodness. Running after false gods, engaging in all kinds of inappropriate sexual activity. Oh, we can see how that's evil. Grumbling. Well, Paul, under the Spirit of God, describes it as evil. What a thing. What a challenging word the Spirit inspired Paul to bring to the Corinthian Christians and indeed to all the people of God through all the ages. Uh, These things, he says to the Corinthians, happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us on whom the culmination of the ages has come. And then a central practical point, if you think you're standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. If you think you've got it made spiritually, if you think you're a paragon of Christian maturity, if you think you're the real deal and God ought to be very impressed with you, if you think you couldn't fall into sin the way some others have, if you look at those who have wandered from the true faith and think a little like Peter did when Jesus warned him that he would deny him, it'll never happen to me. If that's your mindset, if you have that kind of spiritual self-confidence, says Paul, well then you be careful that you don't fall. Paul warns them, Spirit of God warns me, if you think you're standing firm, be careful. Don't allow yourself to drift into a spiritual complacency where you assume that because of good things that have happened in your life in the past, spiritually speaking, that you're definitely fine and you don't need to be on your guard. And it's characteristic of a godly pastor, isn't it, that having said those very challenging words, Paul concludes in a very, very positive light Verse 13 of 1 Corinthians 10 is to be immensely treasured by every Christian, is it not? No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you're tempted, he'll also provide a way out so you can stand up under it. If your memory is such that you can memorize only a small number of Bible verses, there's one to include among them. 
Hey, his first positive statement is, listen, don't think you're any worse than anybody else. You might find yourself struggling with all kinds of temptations. You might be very glad you don't have to tell your neighbor what goes through your mind and heart at times. You might think, goodness, if these people beside me knew what I sometimes am inclined to do, they'd look the other way pretty quickly. But, says Paul, no temptation has seized you except what is common to your fellows. You're not any worse than anybody else. Everybody is in the same boat. Well, there is a certain encouragement in that, is there not? But there's much, much more in what follows. God is faithful. God will not walk out on you because he sees things in your heart that are not as they ought to be. God will not decide that he's not being gracious anymore. God will not give up on you. God will not look on you and say, well, you know what? Can't be bothered with them anymore. God will not, having allowed his son to die on a cross for your sins, say, forget it. I'm through with them. No. God is faithful. And he will sustain his people and bring them through whatever temptation may come their way. What an uplifting, glorious truth. God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. When you're tempted, he'll provide a way out so you can stand up under it. I mentioned John Owen earlier, a slightly earlier author of a same period by the name of Richard Sibbs, uh, said there is more grace in Christ than there is sin in us. What a great statement. Something similar that Paul is highlighting here. Whatever temptation overtakes you, however that spiritual complacency comes back to haunt you, God is faithful. God is gracious beyond your best hope. God is able to do you good and to deal well with you. Well, you might say that's all very important, very interesting, but what has any of it to do with the sacraments? What has any of it to do either with the Lord's Supper or with baptism? A whole lot. Because Paul, as he introduces this passage, uses language relating to both sacraments. Uh, When he talks about the experience of the ancient Israelites, he describes them as having been baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, verse 2. And having used that baptism kind of analogy, he goes straight on to talk about the Lord's Supper. They all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them. And that rock was Christ. Without going into all that he might be implying there in his comparison between Old Testament and New, the practical point is clear, isn't it? Uh, You Corinthian Christians, he says, you might think, listen, we've been baptized, we've taken the Lord's Supper, so we're fine lads, let's do what we like. Well, he says, listen to ancient Israel's experience. Uh, Don't imagine that merely celebrating the sacraments means you can do whatever takes your fancy. No, rather let the sacraments inspire you to walk faithfully with the Lord, to go in his way, to avoid spiritual complacency, to cling to his faithfulness, to live in his power, to be devoted to him. Sacraments ought to have an effect, a little like what a wedding ring is intended to do. Not merely to be there and forgotten about and occasionally glanced at, but to inspire to remind you of the glorious and beautiful one to whom you belong and to thrill your heart with the thought of living to his glory and in his power.
what might we take from that practically? Maybe it's only me. Maybe it's only the areas of the Presbyterian Church in Ireland that I've been familiar with prior to coming here. But I do think at times that we downplay the sacraments a little too much. And if we're honest, that is probably an overreaction to what we understand to be errors within other churches. Uh, we look at Catholicism and we say, well, they are far too interested in the sacraments and they're far too sacramental in their approach and we go to the opposite extreme and we downplay them altogether. Maybe it's only me that's done that, but it does seem to me at times like baptism and the Lord's Supper, yes, we do them, but we don't really think of them as meaning a terrible lot. And if a long time goes without communion taking place, maybe we're not really that bothered. This moment in our history, I think, gives us an opportunity to appreciate them more in a way that I think would be more in line with the way the Bible demonstrates their importance. For a long time, communion could not be celebrated at all. Uh, David this evening has become the first person to be publicly baptized here in more than two years. I haven't checked, but I imagine it's the only time in the history of our congregation that there's been a period of that length without a public baptism. Others have happened more recently on a Sunday afternoon with only a few present. For a long time, there wasn't any happening at all. Now that we've that renewed opportunity to celebrate the sacraments together, what a time to deepen our appreciation of them, to see that they're good gifts God has given to his church to thrill the heart and inspire Christian living. Might I on the same vein invite you this evening to improve your baptism? Am I going up to Lee Doolally in my use of language? Quite possibly so. I, I am again, I'm afraid, being a trifle old-fashioned. It's not something that I do often. Uh, but in bygone days, the word improve was used to mean know the value of something. You would improve your coat by putting it on when you went outside and letting it keep you warm. You'd improve a meal by eating it and letting it nourish you. Uh, and in bygone days, certainly in the Reformed tradition, when somebody was baptised in public, whether on their own profession of faith or on the profession of faith of one of more parents, everybody present who had been baptised would have been invited to improve their baptism. Uh, essentially, the minister would have been saying, were you baptised? Well, then know the benefit of it. Uh, don't just let your attention drift while you see somebody else baptised. See in this symbolism of what Christ did for you. Uh, apply his blood to your heart by faith as you witness the sacrament. Take it to heart that it was shed for you. Live in the light of it. Know the value of it. Rely on it. See it symbolizing not only the pouring out of his blood, but the pouring out of his spirit. Let your celebration of baptism incline your heart to live in the spirit's power to the glory of his name. When a baptism happens in public worship, it's not just significant for the person being baptized and their nearest and dearest. It's significant for all who, by the grace of God, look at it and see symbolized afresh who Christ is and what Christ has done. Baptized people, don't go out just thinking, wasn't that nice for David? I hope it was. Go out and climb to improve your baptism. 
to see symbolized in the outpouring of water the gift of God's Son and the gift of God's Spirit. The sacraments have much to do with day and daily choices, don't they? Paul is writing in such practical terms. Whether you grumble or not, whether you become an idolater or not, whether something else is deemed more important than God or not, well, those are practical, everyday matters. He encourages the Corinthians not just to live any way they like because they've been baptized and taken the Lord's Supper. He encourages the Corinthians to let their baptism and celebration of communion shape their daily life. When that Egypt pulls out in front of you, remember Christ's body was broken for you and Christ's blood shed for you. When your patience is tested, remember as water is poured out to clean the body, the blood of Christ was poured out to cleanse you. When circumstances and situations are overwhelming, remember what a broken body and poured out blood symbolize. When you're inclined to give up, remember how Christ patiently endured the cross, scorned the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Let the sacraments inspire you. Suppose the idea of pre-communion back in the day and maybe up to this day was that it helps us examine ourselves Paul talks about that in the very next chapter, doesn't he? When he speaks specifically of the Lord's Supper, examine yourselves beforehand. Maybe like me, you've been inclined to see that in kind of negative terms. You examine yourself, you look to see if there's anything obviously wrong in your life that you need to put right. Is there a sin that needs to be repented of? That's very important. But it seems to be here that Paul's inviting us not only to look for the negative things that we might need to get rid of, but to ask ourselves what positive things are there. Examine yourself to see if you have a heart that's willing to be inspired. Examine yourself before coming to the Lord's table to see if you're coming with a desire to meet with Christ in a way that will inspire you to live to his glory. Sacraments inspire Christian living. May we meet the Lord in him and live to his glory. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we do thank you for those gifts you have given to your church in baptism and the Lord's Supper. Grant that they would indeed have an inspiring effect upon us. Renew our gratitude to you for them. Help us improve our baptism. Grant that in day and daily life we be conscious of what baptism and the Lord's Supper symbolize and that our choices would reflect that. Bring us this Lord's Day to this place with hearts that are ready and eager to be inspired. It is for Christ's sake that we ask it. Amen. Lord, for the years, your love has kept and guided, urged and inspired us, cheered us on our way. We'll stand and sing together.
Friday, we give you glory for your church and for the privilege of being part of it. And we thank you for the sacraments that you've given to your church to remind us of your great love and to inspire us in our walk with you. Grant that we would know that grace that inspires the heart this evening and in all the days that follow. And so may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forevermore. Amen.